Welcome to the Conscious Community Podcast. This episode, we're speaking with Gogo Akaya, who's featured in the documentary Crazy Wise about her experience and her road to becoming a Sangoma. Um, hello, Gogo. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you, Janae, for having me. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, we'd like to know how you got involved in the documentary. Um, how did they find you? Did they reach out to you or did you reach out to them? How, mm. how did that happen? Yeah, it was interesting because um, while I was going through my um, Sangoma initiation, I was uh, thinking about how um, mental health um, issues and um, people's personal struggles should be documented in some way in like a film, especially when they're using um, different modalities of healing. Um, and I thought, well, what a wonderful <clears throat> Thing that that would be someday maybe I could do it and and then um, months later I've heard about Crazy Wise um, and I reached out and I was just like well thank you for this beautiful thing that you're doing and um, and one of the producers got back with me and we began talking and um, then they were I told them a little bit about my journey and they were interested in coming to New York City to um, do an interview and that's how we got started. Could you uh, explain to our listeners and viewers that uh, haven't uh, heard of the term before what a Sangoma is? Sure. Sangomas are the traditional healers from South Africa. So um, there's a, a large population of traditional healers in South Africa, um, and they are um, what someone would call maybe a shaman or um, the leaders of the community, spiritual leaders of the community where People go for healing of physical, mental, family issues, communal issues. Um, they are the ones that conduct uh, rituals and do and use the traditional medicines um, to help someone through their their life's journey. So um, the population of Sangomas is about oh, there's just a, a I don't know the number. It's a really large population, but about over sixty percent of the population in South Africa still go to see traditional healers as opposed to um, seeing Western med medical doctors or they do both. Oh, that's really interesting that they're still mm -hmm. practicing that in that large of a scale. Um, how did you come in, uh, into that field? Sure. I um, actually, you know, no one chooses to become a Sangoma. Um, it is definitely a calling. Um, um, so this journey led me from um, experiencing a lot of suffering, a lot of mental health imbalances, um, and by way of depression and suicidal ideation, um, hearing voices, seeing things that other people didn't see or, or weren't able to see, and what um, some would call psychosis. And I was looking, um, I was being treated uh, in Western medicine, I was in and out of psych wards. And um, at some point, uh, I was able to reach the peer world, which is um, a mental health community where uh, people with lived experiences. Um, and those people with lived experiences help other people um, become involved and reintegrated into the community after a long, long-term hospitalization or long-term struggle with mental health imbalances. And so I reached out to a peer organization and that helped me to see uh, for the first time that it wasn't something that, um, you know, the doctors tell you that you're going to be on medication for the rest of your life. And um, this is a, a sickness that's, it's a long-term thing, there's no cure. And so I just, something within me really rebelled against that and, and decided, that I was going to go out and search. So I, I found this beautiful peer world um, in the mental health system and became a peer mental health counselor and got some training in that. And then um, as I moved forward, I was able to uh, reach out to someone. Um, I, I was felt very called to traditional methods of healing, shamanism, um, different herbal medicines and I was really researching it and it's like my heartstrings were were pulling really hard and um, I found this beautiful lady who was doing a podcast on Block Talk Radio and I would listen to her um, she was an African priestess and she was also a Sangoma 
and um, her words really resonated with me. And um, at the time, I could really sense an emergence coming through me um, that was um, kind of bubbling over. Um, and I decided to reach out to her to get an ancestral divination. And when I did that, um, she told me through this oracle reading um, from the African perspective, and she only asked me my first name and last name, uh, and the last name of my parents. And uh, she was able to read my life from beginning to end, you know, beginning to present, I should say. Um, and she told me things that no one else really knew about me. And she also said that all of my, um, my issues, especially with mental health and the struggles that I had been going through were a sign of the shamanic calling to become a Sangoma. And uh, that truly hit home for me. And that's how I started on the journey. Um, I've spoken with uh, some friends of mine and other people about uh, kind of how different uh, communities are, uh, because some of the stigma has lifted about exploring ancestral beliefs. Uh, yeah. Like I have one friend who's from Mexico and he's told me that like, himself and a lot of people he knows are exploring, you know, tribal and uh, ancestral shamanic practices there. Um, do you think that that's uh, important for kind of the, the wider black community as far as uh, learning about some of their ancestral practices? Do you think that has value as far as, uh, you know, uh, building that community and, and bringing life back into that community? Mm. That's a beautiful question, actually. Um, there's been a lot of films lately um, and, um, you know, with people of color um, going back to the ancestors. We've uh, recently had like a, a children's film called Coco and also um, um, Black Panther. And I really feel like the um, people are really getting away from the stigma that um, maybe perhaps other religions have created around or other ideologies have created around ancestral veneration and ancestral contact. Um, and for African people in particular, or um, African Americans, we, um, through, the, through, through the slave trade and, and coming over to the Western world, we lost our drums, um, so to speak. We lost our identity. We lost the remembrance of our practices and our culture and um, in some way, in a really big way. And then, you know, parts of us still hold on to those things um, through the Christian church, through other religions. Um, but it's been really beautiful to see um, African-Americans um, really start to take interest in remembering who they are, remembering who we are as a collective whole. Um, and how important our ancestral ways were to the well-being of mind, body, and spirit, um, our family communities, and um, the ancestors. Traditionally, in, in the ancient ways, the ancestor, ancestral veneration and ancestral contact was involved in almost every aspect of the life through um, different rites of passages when the child was born, um, you were able to identify why that child was coming in by contacting the, the ancestral guardians to see what their life's purpose was, what their name should be. Um, and then as they go into um, adulthood and adolescent and going into adulthood, there was a rites of passage, all dealing with the ancestors. And even with marriage and death, the ancestors are very much involved in, um, and guiding and helping our and helping us in our lives, and because we've lost that, we kind of um, stop remembering our power, and and um, and now I feel like this is the time that we're really reawakening to something that feels new, but is very much ancient and very much a part of our culture. So I think it's absolutely important, and I'm really excited that it's being um, displayed in such beautiful ways, especially in the media. Uh, this is a subject that we talked about a little bit uh, with one of our, our previous guests who uh, is an expert in European uh, paganism. Which, mm. um, there's, 
I found in my own research and, and my own uh, exploration of it that there's a, a lot of parallels between the ancient uh, pre, before you had major world religions, you had these shamanic traditions all over the world. And you had them in Europe and you had them in Africa and you had them in Asia and North America. And in a lot of ways that pre-religious uh, uh, pagan cultures, tribal cultures, were much more similar to each other than uh, than they are to you know the the uh, Christian or other religions that that went out and conquered so much of the world, um, and that was actually part of my own uh, experiences that I got interested in uh, European paganism because uh, my ancestors, being from where they're from, if you went back you know uh, five hundred years, they wouldn't have been Christians. And when we were talking with uh, uh, Max Dashu uh, about uh, European paganism, she explained to me that the template that was used when Christianity uh, spread by uh, uh, the Romans uh, was uh, took over Europe, uh, that that process didn't really wrap up until like the 14 or 1500s. And there was still pockets of tribal uh, groups that were still practicing ancestral uh, traditions up until like the 1400s, especially in places like Romania, like really isolated little areas. They were still, um, and even even today, like Iceland, they're still practicing uh, a form of the ancient Norse religion, uh, which is the only place that it's remained uh, where it wasn't just totally wiped out. Um, but I found that myself a really tremendously healing uh, process. Uh, and, uh, but what she was explaining is that they, the practices and the techniques that the church used to hunt down and persecute pagans in Europe, mm -hmm. not even a hundred years later, that's the exact same model that they began using in, in America and Africa, where they would, uh, they would come in, they would occupy it, they would try and Christianize the population, they would, uh, sometimes adopt some local traditions into the religion. Uh, like you have Day of the Dead in Mexico or uh, even Christmas in Europe that, that uh, there was a, a pagan holiday that fell on December 25th that had Christmas trees and all the same. And it, that was one way to kind of get, entice people to, to join the religion. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really fascinating how at this particular time in history, a lot of people are going out and uh, rediscovering those ancestral connections and it seems to have such a tremendous healing potential and um, I think uh, I came to the conclusion and I've heard it elsewhere that uh, historically uh, this was a part of how we worked and especially when it comes to mental trauma and emotional trauma that that uh, consulting our 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 spiritual leaders in the in the village context our shamans was how we recovered from uh you know the loss of a loved one or you know uh, you know loss of parents or grief or you know tragedy like that you would have gone to your 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 shaman to to help you heal and that we've replaced that with this system of of uh scientific mental health you know, medications and, and putting you in a, in a psych ward and all that other stuff that seems to not be terribly effective. Uh, I know when I watched your documentary, you had a number of relapses. The one story that really stuck out to me was where you went in for help and then you uh, uh, immediately uh, attempted uh, suicide, like the moment you were released from the hospital. And that to me was just very like, characteristic of everyone that I've heard who's been through that kind of system is that it just doesn't do what it states to do whereas regardless of whether or not you believe in this stuff this stuff actually does this is kind of how we're built to process this kind yeah. of thing uh, yeah. yes thank you um I definitely agree with so many of those points and especially that you know that like you were saying in the beginning that a lot of, there's no separation between some of the rituals in indigenous cultures and practices of shamanism all over the world. I've uh, worked with shamans from Colombia and 
Peru who do very similar things that we do in South Africa. And I've been to Guatemala and experienced some of um, those traditional healers. And it's so much, um, so much more connected than how we try to separate things uh, with the Western mind and what Christianity has done. Um, and the reason why I feel like ancestral um, healing is so important and vital and um, that it works so well is, is because of a simple um, fact that our DNA is the accumulation of so many generations of ancestors that have come before us. And those, those memories sit in our DNA. Um, so the, you know, when you go to see a doctor, um, you know, a, a Western medical doctor, you know, on one of the forms they ask you, um, what happened, you know, did your, which, on which side of the family did your, um, was there cancer or diabetes or heart disease, right? And so we're, we're, we're understanding that through, because of our DNA, we might carry some traits that our family has passed down. And the same goes on the spiritual level and the, and the mind level as well is, is that we can, um, we remember through our DNA that the traumas, the gifts, the concerns, the worries, the struggles of, there's this remembrance that's activated in our DNA. And we have to pay attention to that. We have to pay attention to what was happening emotionally and spiritually um, to our, our ancestors and our ancestral guides. Um, a big thing in the African American community is that we had lots of ancestors that came over and that were traumatized. And so um, in the way that you see the African American community, our strengths, um, some of the struggles, um, all of that is also ancestral connected. And so as we go through an, a process of going through healing and using the ancient traditions and the ancient shamanic medicines, it really can help balance out some things. And um, in particularly like on my father's side of the lineage, um, there are, my father's mother had um, eight children eight or nine children, and all of them had, um, were very, are, are very artistic, very amazing, beautiful artistic gifts, whether they were a musician or a visual artist. And um, also a lot of them were tormented um, with mental health imbalances or a label with schizophrenia or bipolar um, and, and um, other mental health um, issues and, and, and drug problems as well. And so through this journey, I've learned, uh, and, and going back to the shamanic way, I've learned how much that is activated and that remembrance is sitting within my DNA and that we can choose to be the one that heals our generations going back and forward. So that if we're, we're healing something in our DNA that was a little off or spiritually um, wasn't remembered, we can come back to a place of balance within that spiritual structure and um, make sure that the ones that come after us are in a better place than we were in our ancestral spirits before. Um, so again, I think it's super important, not just for the African American community um, in relation to trauma and the way that we, um, we lost our remembrance, but also for all people, um, you know, even, even European um, cultures who, who uh, may have been the oppressors, that memory is still living in their DNA as well. And it's something that needs to be awakened and cleansed and renewed so that we can all come to a, to a place of balance and become more conscious um, as we continue to evolve, evolve in this world. Now, we've talked about that a lot, that the, um, 
people in general, we need to raise the level of consciousness in order to go forward. Because at this point, the world is so divided. There's so much chaos. It's just, mm -hmm. if you don't do that, we just can't continue to exist. That was something I wanted to mention. I was thinking about this interview that uh, a real common subject that comes up uh, because we're a metaphysical po uh, podcast and we talk about, you know, spirituality and yoga and meditation and all these things that uh, we observed and with our first guest, we, we uh, talked about this, the, the, uh, and he calls it spiritual bypassing, where I have met a great many kind of new age type people who are very blissed out and happy and peaceful and serene. And my response, like I come off and a lot of times she said like a like an ogre bellowing <laughs> across the swamp that I have a lot of anger about the injustice that I see in the world and I kind of feel like if you're on a beach doing yoga and you're really mellow and blissed out and everything like that's good but like that's that's still a very like selfish kind of place to be because you know like okay you've gotten to a place where you're at peace with yourself like you know, there things aren't right. And there is a lot of healing that needs to be done and a lot of things that need to be changed in the world that are just not acceptable. And, you know, if you remove yourself uh, and go off to, you know, uh, Central America and go do yoga on a beach, you know, you might personally feel very good. But like, if the money that you use to go on that nice little vacation or retreat came from an industry that's, you know, exploiting indigenous people halfway across the world or you know extracting resources that pollute the environment like you know like you're you're patting yourself on the back for being very enlightened while you do your you know your, your practice but you're you know like that's just the first step and that you have to like what i feel like you kind of you then have to go out and like try and heal the world is kind of where i'm at like that you know okay, you've healed yourself, now you have to go try and help heal, heal the world. Like, you didn't heal yourself, so now you can just feel good about yourself for the rest of your life. And you don't have any responsibility for taking that forward. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah, kind of reflected in what I see you doing, is that you now you're trying to help other people. Right, and I agree. I think there's a need for that. Um, you know, I have a lot of conversations um, uh, with people who... Um, have taken the medicine from India or um, ancient Kemet or Africa, um, which is yoga, and have been down to um, been down to um, South America and have um, taken been a part of the ancient ayahuasca medicine and have been to Central Africa to to take a part of iboga and all of these things. And there's these different medicines that are coming back to and becoming available to all of us to help us to remember. And it's so important for us to get ourselves together first. Um, so that, that part is very essential. Um, but then there is the time to, to spread out, to, to allow that medicine to touch someone else. And so um, with my story with through Crazy Wise, I've been really, um, it's been a continuous process of, of learning, of growing, of, um, you know, each person that I see and that I work with, I see a reflection of myself um, from which I came or even something that I may have may be dealing with in the present moment. So each person comes to me as a teacher and it helps me um, to have complete humility and, and compassion, not only for myself, but for them. And so I'm super grateful to be able to have um, shared um, my story through Crazy Wise. And um, that's what it's really about. Um, uh, in becoming a Sangoma, um, they call the initiates um, Twazas. Twaza is a word that means the sick ones. So um, when you come in, you are called a Twaza because you are sick. And you have to go through a process with an elder shaman to learn how to be unsick, to heal yourself, to rely on your ancestral guardians, to rely on your strength, to, to rely on your inner knowing, to rely on the activation of that, that DNA memory that I was talking about, and to integrate all of those parts of you um, 
that were left behind through whatever process it was um, when you came into this life and whatever conditioning that was um, that we came into this life. And so um, once we have started that process, then we can step out into the world and say, hey, okay, now how can I take another person's hand and, and help um, someone else in this journey? I think that that's just a calling of anyone who's been through um, any kind of trauma or any kind of experience. It's, it's almost your, it's your responsibility. It's your calling to help someone else um, once they've helped you. I was going to ask you, since you've done the documentary, has it changed your life? Has it increased the size of your practice? How has it changed um, what, what you're doing? Yeah, I was working um, as a mental health counselor during um, my process, during the training process. And um, well, the film came out, I think, last May, last year. Um, and it has been truly, truly amazing and, and humbling experience. Um, before that, about six months before that, I had started my practice as a Sangoma full time. Um, so now I live here in the beautiful mountains of Southern California working um, uh, and doing the practice. But I, I would I give so much gratitude and thanks for um, Crazy Wise in the documentary because not only um, is the stories are the stories being highlighted, but there's so many people that it's really deeply resonating with them. And they are seeing that there is something outside of Western medicine, there's something, there's this need to integrate the spirit within our practice. Um, and that in the mental health system, a lot of times there's this new thing that's called um, whole person care, so to speak, where you're supposed to take care of the whole person. but um, they're really leaving out, there's still, there's a lot of places um, in Western medicine where they're still leaving out the spirits. Mm -hmm. And so my goal with, with the emergence of Crazy Wise and all the beautiful things that are taking place because there's this big movement that's happening and there's lots of different projects that have come out of the film is just um, going to educate um, mental health professionals. Um, so I've been speaking a lot in front of um, um, audiences and um, people that uh, are professionals in the mental health system, whether they're psychoanalysis or, or therapists, and also people with lived experiences to help um, both of those subjects come together and say, hey, how can we connect to the spirit? How can we recognize the spirit um, as well in our practice, how can we integrate that part? Because that part is also a part of the whole, whole person care. And so that's been really the momentum of Crazy Wise, helping people to see a different perspective and really um, reframing um, the experience of what mental health can look like and what these labels can look like and that they can be a much more powerfully healed when we integrate um, spiritual, the spiritual matter in the spiritual realm. Yeah, there's uh, another thing that um, Max Dashu mentioned that uh, I think is really important. Uh, that is that the the initial treatment that uh, shamanic cultures got was they were labeled as satanic, and yeah. that was, that there was uh, you know uh, basically most of when they came upon a new area to that there would be. Uh, various local gods and spirits and and uh, that they would either label them as devils or they would make them saints. So a lot of the early Catholic saints were, you know, uh, Latin pagan uh, gods and goddesses. Well, before and, that, they were the European pagan. Yeah, pagan. yeah. I mean, there was, yeah. there's, there's some of them, some of them were, were elevated and became saints in, in other Christianity, and some of them were made uh, devils. Um, but uh, that even though we've kind of gotten away from being a, a quote-unquote, like, Christian uh, civilization, you know, ostensibly we're, we're a uh, uh, secular society, you know, the, the, the government and the religion are separated, there still is a really widespread attitude where it's kind of it's kind of acceptable to be Christian or Jewish or even Muslim before it's acceptable to be any kind of uh, 
uh, shamanic or, or uh, pagan practice. So uh, European paganism is, is kind of derided and there's a real negative stigma to it and people call it Satanism. And, uh, and uh, I think that's really important to recognize that as such a, something that's so healing, that it's it shouldn't be uh, stigmatized in that way, uh, and that it is really kind of a vestigial, leftover, uh, you know, uh, from the dark ages practice to stigmatize those kind of uh, shamanic beliefs because they're they're so important, and I've seen them be so effective at healing these things that um, uh, I think it's really important to admit to ourselves that a lot of the stigma we attach to them is based on that kind of leftover, you know, Christian superstitious approach call to it, it. Christian is most is colonialism is essentially what it is. Because yeah. like, I mean I mean that's exactly how it was used. It was used as a justification. It's okay for us to go conquer these people because they're they're worshiping the devil. And that's yeah, so you it's know good that's for an attitude yeah. that we've just got to get rid of in our <laughs> society. Absolutely. And I think with forms like this and with um, Crazy Wise, we're absolutely taking off the veil of stigma. Um, it, it's funny because I, I think I mentioned in the documentary or at least in one of the clips that when I was telling my mother about, um, she, she wasn't so familiar. She, we were raised in a Christian church, so she wasn't so familiar with what shamanism was, um, but she could understand and, and see that my life was changing. Mm -hmm. and. Um, one of the conversations that I had with her, I was like, you know, this is what I'm doing. And I, I tried to relate it to um, like Native American so that she would kind of understand what was happening. And she was like, well, okay, well, it sounds a little scary. And it, as long as it's not that voodoo stuff, you know, and um, we've just been programmed and conditioned to think that practices like voodoo, which comes from um, the voodoo tradition of West Africa and Benin wow. and Togo, are really powerful ancient ancestral shamanic healing modalities. And um, for so long, there were so many different films um, back uh, in the 60s and 70s that really made Buddhism a Satanism yeah. uh, and, and any African spiritual practice, like really Satanism and, and, and um, Well, you had Santeria, which has yeah. African elements in it and uh, yeah. yeah, that's the the whole Central American region where you had African slaves and yeah. tribal people and European Christians, and you had this just collision of of cultures, and they they got driven underground and labeled as satanic. Uh, and um, but what's interesting is that I was talking to uh, a uh, uh, Mexican friend of mine, and uh, he said that where he lives, they've never stopped practicing them. That they have always, like they, the like church came in and they were all supposedly Catholic, but they were all practicing it in secret. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the, a lot of the stories that I hear um, in regards to that is that um, when, the Afri when the Africans came over and they were handed Christianity, they used their, still the Orishas and the, the gods and goddesses and the ancestors and they mass them under the saints and so there uh, any catholic saints would be very much associate associated with an orisha um god or goddess um and they would still do their prayers and their rituals and their candles and all of those things um in their homes so um in a lot of areas it was it was not lost um in the in the middle of america but in in here in northern america it was almost completely obliterated you know hoodoo is now something that has been integrated and kind of come back um and i don't know a lot about hoodoo but i know it takes some african root magic and mixes it with um with the culture with the african-american culture here so yeah i absolutely see that yeah there's um uh I just lost my oh, well, one thing I thought was really interesting in the documentary is how they had so many of these psychiatrists and psychologists talking mm -hmm. about problems in the mental health field. 
Like mm -hmm. one guy, I believe he's the example that even caffeine dependence was in the DSM-5. Like, yeah, it, yeah. Well, everything's been pathologized. Everything, yeah, everything's been a, turned into an illness instead of, you know, just there, saying. There's a medication for you yeah. no matter who you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was I, my own experience is that I was, di I had a diagnosis. I was giving a medication. I was on it for about a year and a half. I had absolutely no progress. I was completely unable to function. Uh, I uh, realized that I, my, this was going to be my life if I didn't stop that. And I, 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 I actually was familiar with shamanic practices before any of that happened. So I was very lucky in that, like, I grew up in a house where, uh, uh, alternative medicine and spirituality and Buddhism and, and shamanic practices were all just like daily conversations. So like I was already aware of this stuff and I, I basically was like, well, none of this is working for me. I'm going to try that. And I, I really just threw myself into exploring it. And one thing that that's just like in North America where, where, uh, uh, knit or, uh, African Americans had their, practices pretty much snuffed out other than little bits here and there you see some music and whatnot and uh uh maybe some some uh traditions but uh in europe uh it's pretty much dead that that there has not been that that, that other than some symbols or christmas trees and stuff like that most most european paganism is dead so like i really had to like almost like mentally recreate it for myself and like in doing that it i felt it was a very healing process and today i don't have any issues you know it's that like whatever whatever i was experiencing is no longer a part of my experience um so i think that that's something that we need to recognize as a society as when someone's given this label that you can change you know you're not always going to be that that you're it's fluid you can get better it seems like you were saying that they're like telling you well you're going to be this way for the rest yeah, of your life stamp it on your forehead and that's yeah. who you are and there's the a stigma the that comes with that and that's not mm -hmm. healing at all you're, when you break yeah. your arm you don't have a broken arm for the rest of your life <laughs> right right and it's almost like the western medicine some sometimes um uh can take you down a, a deeper and a darker tunnel by by telling you that by giving you the label and then saying that there's there's no cure and you're going to be like this for the rest of your life um and it's just the money making industry you know it's about the money and um interestingly and enough my diagnosis was initially slapped on me uh in small part because i was talking kind of publicly about about shamanic practices and that some of the People in my life thought that I was going crazy when, in fact, I was just talking about what is now kind of an open debate. Um, but, uh, at that time, there really wasn't any recognition in the in the mental health system that any of this had any kind of validity. So it's really exciting to me to see that it's that you were talking about the whole person and and working, you know, as a as a counselor, and then this this kind of being a a connected practice. I think that's really exciting. How receptive are the counselors you've worked with to the idea of of the incorporating the spirituality? Are they excited about it? Are they hesitant? Are they just unsure? I think there's a little bit of both, but I mean, if they're open enough to to come and see Crazy Wise or or look into it, I've been dealing with more um, people that have been a lot more open and it's been, I never thought, like if you would have told me six years ago that I'd be speaking to psychiatrists and people and professionals in the mental health and having this platform, I would have been like, yeah, really, right? But it's been just amazing, the response. And there's so many good conversations happening and questions happening. Like um, one person, um, you know, we're one of the things that we're trying to do is bring the idea of recovery back into the mental health system, that there is opportunity for us to recover. Um, and another thing is um, one of the uh, therapists had asked a question about, well, well, how do we, we integrate the two? And one of her suggestions was um, to have a forum or a place where if a therapist sees something that's out of their realm, um, for instance, if there is someone coming to them and saying that they're hearing um, voices and they're receiving these divine messages and here's the messages and here's the 
symbols that I see, and this is spiritual connect connected or universal sign, um, just things that may trigger that somebody is having a spiritual experience or a kundalini awakening or any of those things that they can have a list of traditional healers or practitioners um, that they would be open to doing a referral process with, you know, and that would be amazing, you know, if we, if we had that type of, of ongoing conversation and connection with um, Western medicine and the practices. I know that everybody's not going to be open and down for it, but there's so many that are, especially the, even, even if we start in the private sector, um, I think it would be tremendously helpful. No, that's, that's really, really great to hear. I would highly recommend that uh, people go out and check out that documentary. It was very validating to me to hear some of my own observations uh, kind of repeated back by these psychiatrists and mental health professionals. I unfortunately, uh, and this is another issue that I'm always bringing up, but it, if you don't have letters after your name and some kind of accreditation, people don't listen to you. So you can be a shamanic healer and and if you don't, you know, if you, Gogo Akaya, went out and got your degree in psychiatry and were saying the same thing, people would be receptive to it in a way that they aren't as a spiritual uh, advisor and a spiritual practitioner. That uh, and So it's really, uh, I think, very useful to have uh, accredited mental health professionals making the same kind of observation because it, it's, you know, there's a, often, well, you don't have, you know, you, you haven't been uh, at, at, uh, acknowledged by the system, so your opinion doesn't matter. And uh, that was the very validating thing for me to see that. I'd see somebody on screen with PhD after their name and be like, see? Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. what I was saying. Yeah, that was beautiful. Yeah. Um, well, this has been really great to talk to you. Is there any uh, websites or projects that you have going on right now you'd like to tell our listeners and viewers about? Yes, um, sure. I, I do have a website. It's um, sangomahealing.com. Can you spell and it? It's S-A-N-G-O-M-A, -A, the word healing, H-E-A-L-I-N-G. Uh, dot com and you can reach me there you can email me um, um, there's lots of different services and information there and, and um, I have a I have two things that are happening right now I have a program called embracing the gift um, which is for people with spiritual emergence um, that feel like they have some sort of calling or feel like they need some guidance in the way of what is happening with their own mental health, or maybe they've been diagnosed, but it doesn't resonate with them, and they want to go along the spiritual path that um, may be more suitable, or um, or that that is more um, in connection with their spirit. And so, there's this program called Embracing the Gift, where I take people through a deep healing and cleansing process and then a holding of space to allow them to open up to their natural gifts that, are, that may be wanting to emerge. Um, and I also have a mental health scholarship program for those in underserved communities that have been in the system um, that um, have been diagnosed but do not have the funds to um, get this kind of treatment or get the help that they need. And um, that is, open and available, it, it needs to be funded um, so that I can continue to take in more people um, that do not have um, the means to um, get the work done. So I remember there was a time when I was, um, before I knew about my calling, but I was struggling and I was seeing, I was having lots of visuals and I was in a very, very low, deep, dark place and I couldn't leave my room. Um, I was on the phone calling different shamans and shamanic centers, you know, in all over the world and like, please take me, I'll come and volunteer. I'll do anything. I don't have, I don't have the money. And I, I remember that, um, that there was no help and I ended up in the hospital. There was no one that could actually take me in. And um, 
So when, when people come to me, I always remember that. And I always remember there are people that just don't have it that really need this kind of work and this kind of support. Um, because a lot of times when, especially if someone's been dealing with this, uh, with mental health imbalances for a long time, some people are at the point where they're not able to work. Um, they're not able to have, um, you know, their basic needs met. And so I'm talking about those specific people and um, how we can work together through this fundraising project to allow some of these people into the program and into the healing space. Well, that's definitely very important. Yeah. I mean, that's where I was. Like I was not, I was not able to function at my, at my absolute worst state. I, I couldn't talk much less work. So that's, uh, uh, I've, I've come a long way to relearn how to talk yeah. again. <laughs> shut up and talk too much. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll stop talking. Um, so. Well, oh, and your the website for the movie was. Um, yes, the website for the film is crazywisefilm.com. Okay. And that's W I S E as in wise, like wise. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And um, just in relation to the scholarship, um, you can find that on my website or and or on Facebook under um, uh, Shamanic Killing for Mental Illness. Okay, and, and that's a Facebook group that people can go to. Correct? Yeah, Facebook you can link fundraising. that on our article as well, so people can find that group. All right. And thank you very much for talking to us. This was lovely. Thank you for inviting me. And Have a beautiful day.